began to realize that justice is integral to the gospel, just as important as charity. And so we developed a justice and peace awareness because the first step in justice is awareness. And then you discover there is no justice until there is justice for the earth. And so therefore, the JP office became the JPIC office, which is justice and peace and integrity of creation. Part of learning more about justice and peace and integrity of creation, especially integrity of creation, one of the strongest things about that for me is the interconnectedness, which also has to do with relationships. When I first joined the congregation, I probably was thinking more of my own sanctification, my own relationship with God, and I was going to really try and, and live out this consecration to God. As I developed and learned, I realized that the only way I could live out this relationship with God was in relationship with others. That was partly what led me to go to the North, to go to what was a growing concern about the plight of our Aboriginal people in Canada. They acknowledged that God was in control and they were able to allow God to help them through difficult times. So I learned some of that from them, to trust in Providence in that way. Mm -hmm. In the 1960s, after the Second Vatican Council, uh, there was a call put out by the Canadian bishops for religious congregations in Canada to consider establishing missions in Latin America. We went with the idea that we would establish one mission in one country. As it turned out, we established two missions, one in Guatemala and one in Peru. I was in the northern part of Peru for 10 years. People had just squatted on the land and there was about 40, 45,000 people and they had nothing. There was nothing there. So because of the need, that's why they chose for us to go there. We were in Guatemala, there was a civil war there, and so it was a very dangerous time. And there were a lot of killings that happened, as well as an earthquake, a major earthquake. 25,000 people died, there. so I was part of that. I think when our sisters came back from Guatemala and Peru, I had a sense that they were reading the gospel from the underside. They were reading the gospel through the eyes of their people, through the eyes, the minds, and hearts of the poor. And they were challenging. I just, oh, I, I was in awe of what they were saying. Sometimes uh, we could see that we were no longer needed in certain areas, that there were others who had learned the same or who had the same compassion and had that, that they, we didn't need to be there, but there were other areas opening up. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Spirituality Center team. And the sisters in our house have been praying for all of you as we prepared for your coming. So just a bit of information for those- Another way I think we, we reach out to the poor is to the Spirituality Center that seems to be one of the big poverty in our society today. Those who are spiritually poor, people who need quiet, who need some kind of spiritual direction, who need time for getting connected with God or with their own better self. And so our spirituality center provides that space and that kind of direction and guidance. So, um Maybe it would even help us to situate ourselves back in the chapter of 1994 where the congregation as a whole chose five directions for the next four years and this eradicating violence against women and children was one of those. 
Um, Peggy, I see you have that statement from 1994. Our purpose was to raise awareness, to change attitudes, and to take actions to promote healing in the three levels we mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, personal, congregational, and societal. Mm -hmm. We gathered together six or eight people and identified that the best contribution we could make to healing violence at this point was to do education. And so we began to plan for conferences every two years on a large scale. We began with what in theology was an underpinning that was leading to violence against women, the subjugation of women, and what could we do about that? How could our understandings develop and change? With the JPEG office, uh, the ministries that have grown out of it in the last few years, as sisters were able to, for example, they took part in the protests and now because our sisters are older for the most part. They sign petitions and write letters and to make phone calls. They say, I can do that, even though I no longer can go out and do things. And so it's led them to get involved from home in a few of the issues that they would not have gotten into before, except that now their awareness of the injustice has led them into it. It's one thing to have mercy and pity and have charity towards others, and we've always done that, and that's very important. But what I see important now to us is facing and empowering people to get their justice. It's very demanding to, to help do that, but we must. And sometimes just standing with some of the people who have suffered and seeing their strength and their courage to go on gives you the courage too and, and gives you some empowerment and joy and, and some sense that something good can happen.